speaker is Brigadier General Jack Hagan. Uh, you have the, the bios of each and every one, and uh, so I'm not going to read that to you. I, I do believe uh, you weren't allowed to register unless you, I, I could be confident that you could read, so I'm sure you can do that. Uh, I just want to say something personal about General Hagan. Uh, I had a couple of other generals, uh, good friends of mine, who because of various reasons, one had health issues and one had a family issue, they could not attend. And so I needed, I felt I wanted to, you know, keep the status at that level, so I called up Jack Hagan pretty much at the last minute. Uh, he was, he had just torn a ligament in his foot, he was moving from uh, uh, Charleston, South Carolina to Columbia and he had about 16 other things going on as well as a couple of speaking engagements. I said, Jack, can you help me out here? And he said, for you, Bob? Yeah, definitely, absolutely. Uh, he dropped everything what he was doing. He said, I'll get back to you the next day, see if I can rearrange all of that. Got back to me, and uh, within 24 hours, he was, he was up on website as a speaker. He is the personification of, of the Marine Corps uh, motto. Semper Fidelis, Semper Fi. Uh, on another personal level, because he helped me out in this way, he figured he had to get back at me. So we, uh, we I, I spent a lot of time in New Orleans, and, uh, and he was originally born and raised in New Orleans. So I, I asked him on, on the drive from the airport yesterday, well, what part of New Orleans were you from? And he said, Lakefront. And I told him, well, you know, I... I Spent my time in the Irish Channel, which was kind of a rough section of New Orleans, by the St. Thomas Housing Projects. And I said to him, General, I, I never actually went to the lakefront. He said to me, yeah, we like to keep the riffraff out. <laughs> Gen General Jack Hagan. Raise your right hand. I, do, I state your name. Do solemnly swear to support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same. I take this obligation freely without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion, and that I will well and faithfully discharge the duties of the office on which I'm about to enter. So help me God. This is the blank check every serviceman and woman wrote for one life payable on demand. Did their life matter? Ronald Reagan said, people spend their lives trying to figure out whether their life mattered or not at the end. The United States Marines don't have that problem. The, do <laughs> so does your life matter? Can you go home at night, look your family in the eye, look yourself in the mirror, and say I contributed, that I did something today to protect America, that I did something to contribute? Well, every serviceman can, every law enforcement, firefighter, emergency medical, they all can say that. What can you say about it? We're a country at war. We've been at war since 2003. It's the longest war America's ever been in. But we're not really a country at war or a nation at war. We're an armed forces at war. During World War II, the population of the United States was 139 million, with 13 million men and women in uniform. Today, our population is 320 million, two and a half times as large, and our armed forces is only 2.5 million. That includes all the National Guard, reservists, active duty, everybody, one-fifth. World War II, 9.3% of the population was in the service. Today, less than 1% of 1% is in the military. We're a military at war. We're not a nation at war. There's three things you have to do to win a war. You have to destroy the enemy's military capability to wage war. 
You have to destroy the enemy's economic capability to make war, and you have to destroy the will of the people to continue the war. And a war is not over until the enemy says it is. Today in this asymmetric battlefield, there's no place to find the economic base or the will of the people. This is a difficult war to win, and we'll be at it for a long time. One of the reasons is because after we took Baghdad in 2003, occupied Iraq, we didn't know what to do with it. We never occupied a country before, really. At the end of World War II, Germany was crushed. They were ready for us to show up, and they wanted us there before the Russians got there. We chased a couple of rogue SS units around, but that was it. That really wasn't an occupation. It turned into a tourist adventure. We didn't occupy Japan because the emperor got on the radio and said, we will endure the unendurable. There was no resistance. Had we actually had to land in Japan and take it by force, had the emperor given the Japanese the uh, Winston Churchill speech, we'll fight them on the beaches and the valleys, we'd still be there today killing their grandchildren. We just gave out a couple of years ago the last Purple Heart that was minted in preparation for the invasion of Japan. You know how many Purple Hearts that is? That's how many people we thought we were going to lose in the invasion of Japan. So we don't know how to occupy a country. We thought it was like us. Hey, we'll just show up, set everybody free, and they'll have this big democracy and they'll look just like us. Well, that didn't happen. Had we left right after that, we'd have what you've got going on today, the destabilization of the region. Shiites and the Sunnis would have gone at it. The Turkish Kurds and the Iraqi Kurds would have merged to do Kurdistan, Kurdistan, create their own nation. The Turks wouldn't have liked that, so they would have moved in and tried to wipe them out. Now we've got to deal with a NATO member who wants to create genocide. Now, the Iranians might have wanted to come over and settle a few scores in Iraq. Who knows what Hamas would have wanted to do to Israel. The whole place would have caved in. Us staying had to be so we could stabilize the region. And we still don't know how to get out yet. Because there's no winning an idealistic war except by just hunting them down one at a time and killing them. There's no conversion, there's no repatriation. It's just not going to work. And the continued rhetoric of the children and bringing them up in a, and one of the other speakers is going to talk about this, about how this just starts at the grassroots and moves up. So this is going to be a long adventure. And I don't know how we get out of it. So where are we today? You know, how do you get involved in this? How do you prepare yourself? Well, there's all kinds of things people can do. You, you can go to the Red Cross, just take the basic life saving, first aid, FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency has courses online. Local groups have emergency management courses. Uh, law enforcement, you can educate yourself. Watch the news. Read what new legislation is being promos, proposed that deals with homeland security. Write your congressman, your senator, see how they vote. You know, be active in participation in what goes on. Don't just be a bystander. Also, be alert. If it doesn't look right, tell somebody. 
law enforcement, every law enforcement agency has a Homeland Security intelligence rep. And they're interested in this kind of information. So you can find someone through local law enforcement to talk to about something that doesn't look right. I mean, what's right about 12 guys living in one room and never coming out? You know, a little strange. The other part of our, our mystery in the Middle East is we don't do cultural studies. We really don't learn what the other people are like and how they should be treated and what's good for them and what's not. You know, America is a very interesting place. I mean, we are, a, we are an experiment in progress in democracy. We're the only country that's ever really had a civil war at which we fought for years. In fact, there were more casualties in the American Civil War than in all the other wars America has ever fought combined. And the interesting part about this over 600,000 casualties of the Civil War is they were all Americans. Regardless of whether they were on the North or the South, they were still Americans. Even those that had just gotten off the boat as immigrants felt that they were Americans. So every casualty of the Civil War was an American. But at the end of the war, we saluted each other and we went home. No one went to prison. There weren't mass executions. You know, we just went home. That is so unusual. We're the only country that's ever happened to. So what, what else goes on? There are people out there who want to kill you. I mean, they don't like you. They don't like your music. They don't like your religion. They don't like your clothes. They don't like anything about you. And their religion says you need to die. And they don't think about anything else. They don't think about going to the mall or getting their hair cut, or cutting their grass, or whether they got to pick up a kid at a soccer game. They just think about how they're going to kill you and become a martyr, and go to heaven and be greeted by Allah and the 72 virgins. What a fantasy. I mean, think about that for a minute. 72 virgins. What do they look like? And after the 72nd, what do you do now? <laughs> do they all come back to life? Are you stuck with 72 wives? I mean, there's some downsides to this thing that I don't think these people think about. You know? And it's virgins. It didn't say women, you know? I mean, who knows? It's a, it's, a strange, it's a strange fantasy. But as we said in the Marine Corps, that's not our problem. Our problem is to help you get there and enjoy it. So we got you involved. Go out there and try to do something for your country. Do something for your nation. You know, the people who, who are out there on the front lines today are following what I call the path of the warrior. Because there are many paths in society. There's the path of the teacher the healer, the statesman. But the path of the warrior is the hardest path of the paths of service. <clears throat> it is the most difficult of the paths because the warriors have a calling. 
They're called throughout history to protect their families, their countries, their communities. They're called to fight for others' safety and freedom, knowing that that path may lead to the cost of their life and the suffering of their loved ones. To follow the path of the warrior requires three things, courage, commitment, and resilience. Courage to face the horror and brutality of war, the savagery of hand-to-hand -hand combat. The commitment to leave their family behind, to follow the sound of the guns and the beat of the drum, to protect those that they love. And the commitment to the warrior on the right and the warrior on the left that no warrior is ever left behind on the battlefield. Resilience to maintain their humanity in the face of inhumanity. The warrior knows the price of freedom. Freedom is paid for in blood and tears. The blood of the warrior, the tears of their family. The politics and the public opinions flow like the ebb and tide of the ocean. But the path of the warrior is steadfast. The path is for honor and duty. They don't seek war, but they never flinch from it. They're always prepared to give their life. And they're not afraid. For it's the warrior who stands on the ramparts of freedom on the fringes of civilization, holding back the night so that we can sleep in our beds safe at home. We owe our eternal thanks to those warriors and their family. May God bless them and keep them. Does your life matter? Theirs does. Thank you. Yes. Do you think a rat will help to awaken a sleeping public? <laughs> Do you think a draft would help awake the sleeping public? Well, I think the draft would do a lot of things. It would, if I had, if I was king of the earth or the world, I would have national conscription. Everybody goes. Men, women, the blind, the blind, sick, everybody. You're classified, you're given tests, you're given choices. Everybody serves two years of service, whether that's throwing letters in the post office, picking up paper in the park, or in the armed forces. <clears throat> the more specialized you want, the longer you have to serve. But then you come back and go to college or do whatever you want. The biggest, the biggest resistance to the draft will be the community colleges. They're cash cows and they want all that money for big high school. And they're not going to give that up. So, yes, I would have national conscription. Question. Yes, sir. General, oh. yes. first of all, thank you for your service, sir. Um, yeah. uh, my question relates to the ongoing battles that are going on overseas. And uh, today there's a movie out called uh, Thank You for Your Service. And uh, it's very important that I think a lot of people know about the movie and uh, maybe spread the word around about the guys and what they have to deal with when they come home. Very important. But my question to you is, sir, do you feel that the handcuffs are finally off the military to try to help solve what we've been going through and help deal with this uh, ongoing problem overseas? And uh, thanks to the current administration and President Trump. That's my question, sir. Well, 
I think the military t today under General Mattis um, as a Secretary of Defense will be a much different military because he will listen to his generals because he's been one. And I think the president respects his judgment. We've had many administrations that didn't, didn't trust the generals. And so they ran the war out of the White House. I mean, Lyndon Johnson did bombing out of the White House. Target selection wasn't done in the, in the combined arms room. It was done in the Oval Office. I mean, how do you do? How do you do targeting out of the Oval Office? That's a little crazy in the jungle of Vietnam. So um, I think, the, I, I, you know, the handcuffs are off. I don't think that's a right phrase for this. I think that they'll be listened to and it'll be done better than it's been done before. Rumsfeld didn't listen to the generals when they told him they needed 100,000 people to occupy Iraq in the beginning. He fired General Shalovskovsky for saying that. You know, that's what it took. So I think the military will be in a much different place now with General Mattis. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, uh, my name is Roman, and I've got actually two questions. One, you described the war. War basically is destroy, bomb, and force the opposition into complete surrender. I don't think we're in a war. I think the military is being utilized as a social experiment. That's my first question. The second one is the long-term uh, fight that we have is really with an ideology that, that believes in death above life, and how do we change that? Let me see if I understand your question, your questions. Um, the first one is, if we are at war, then you destroy the enemy, bomb, submit, and then walk away or help them out. We're not at war, or are we? That's my real question. Or is the military being utilized for a social experiment? Well, that's two different parts. The, the military has always been used as a social experiment. We were the first people to break ground on integration, uh, women in jobs. I mean, the, the military has been used as a social uh, petri dish forever. Um, are we at war? Yes, we are. We're at war with terrorism. We're at war with stateless groups who have no country uh, and have an ideology. I mean, it's a different war. It's not the same as lines on the map and ground to occupy. Uh, it's an asymmetrical war. Thanks for your questions. Yeah. Uh, during the Obama administration, he had fired about 300 flag officers and a lot of uh, un, a lot of colonels also um, uh, decided to to uh, because they didn't agree with his policies. So I'm worried about the military today. The who, who are the generals that are still there that are agreed with uh, Obama's policies? Uh, who makes up the military today? It seems like like the Obama generals are still there now. Well, I'm. <clears throat> A general officer who makes it to four stars usually puts in about 10 years as a general officer. So all the generals I know are apolitical. In the old days, general professional officers didn't even vote in the national election. They didn't vote for the president. Most of the people I know that are professional officers don't vote for the president either. because. The president's the commander in chief. Doesn't matter who it is, those are the orders. So they try to stay as apolitical as possible. So we have the same group of people that, as they grow up. 
General, I refer to your statement uh, that when we go into a country and defeat them, we then don't know what to do. We don't necessarily manage that country or occupation. When I served uh, as an officer, I felt that we had choices back then, and one of the divisions was civilian government. We were told that uh, this is a division that goes in and helps to run a defeated country. In recent years, or in many years, that's disappeared. I haven't seen anything about it. Well, even when you were in, it was a very tiny group of people, way too small to be prepared to run a country like Iraq. And then, <clears throat> On top of that, many of the things that we trained for for decades when it came time to execute, we took the book, threw it out the window, and started all over again. Like we never knew what we were doing. So I'm not convinced today that we still are teaching in the War College and other places how to occupy a country. So really, because you own it. You're now responsible for everybody there. The power, the water, the medical, the utilities, law enforcement. I mean, you own it. And you have to take care of it. And I don't think we're, we're still there with that one. We want to shove that one off on the State Department. Let them do it. Hi, Steve Gers up with a question uh, about uh, Islam and the way it's perceived by our military. I agree with the comment that uh, our war is with an entirely different culture, a theocracy. And that ideology uh, is uh, what has been attacking us in various forms, either as state or non-state actors. What kind of training are we now getting in our military regarding the threat of that theocratic ideology? so that they can uh, respond to it more effectively. Well, it depends on what level you're talking about. And I think that one of our other speakers can probably answer that question a little better than I can. Um, and I'm going to toss that one to Claire. Uh, yeah. But, but the individual Boots on the ground don't care. Their job is to seek out the enemy and destroy it. They need to know how to do fire and maneuver, clear room, you know, use cover and concealment properly. To them, it's just another person with a weapon trying to kill them. They don't need to know what the ideology is. It helps, but to the Lance Corporal, he doesn't care. That lady's been waiting. Thank you very much. Um, Egypt declared the Muslim Brotherhood a terrorist organization. And it seems like McMaster is reticent to declare the Muslim Brotherhood a, a terrorist organization. And I just wonder what you think is going on that there's any kind of reticence to do that. The Middle East is doing it. Why can't we? Uh, I, I'm going to pass on that question because I'm not qualified to answer it. Uh, General, thank you very much for your talk. It's very good and interesting. But my question to you is because my personality is optimistic and yet you gave us a very pessimistic future because you said there's no way to solve this type of asymmetrical war that we know of. But I like to think that uh, because we don't know what it is today, as long as we do what you said right now and continue bringing the battle to them, sometime in the future <coughs> perhaps that will come forth. So could you comment on that please? Well yes. Always predict the worst. As soon as something goes right, declare victory. Everybody's happy. You know, nobody, nobody complains when you 
predict the worst and then something good happens. So that's why I'm an, I'm an internal pessimist. Because <laughs> if I was an optimist and it failed, then you wouldn't like me. <laughs> uh, the second part of that is, yes, I hope we figure out how to do this in the future. I mean, there's always hope. Uh, General, good morning. Uh, thank you very much. Um, not long ago, a letter uh, made the rounds. You may have seen it on the internet by a uh, retired, I think it was Colonel. His name was Harrington. Uh, rounds on the internet. And he uh, laid out a devastating uh, criticism of what's going on inside the service academy, specifically West Point. And of course, we've all seen the, 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 uh, the photo recently of the young cadet who was just graduating you know, opening up his shirt to show a Che Guevara t-shirt underneath, um, showing his cap. You've seen this photo, showing his cap inside, um, and, you know, talking about communism. Can you speak to the rot that's going in on inside the service academies and, uh, and also the, uh, the staff and command colleges? Well, the service academies are interesting institutions. Um, I went to the Citadel, the military college in South Carolina. My sons went to the Naval Academy. Um, the culture inside those institutions, I will say, is very, very similar to the culture inside a prison or an institution. Um, it, it's a different mindset. And cadets and midshipmen do some of the dumbest things you can think of for the dumbest reasons. Um, it's the product that gets out that is more important. I mean, I've seen the same issues, cheating scandals, I mean, just ridiculous things go on Year, year after year at the various academies. And you'd think, well, they just did that five years ago. Why are they doing it again? It's a whole different crew. Um, <clears throat> when I was the director of safety and enforcement of the California Public Utilities Commission, I told people, you cannot legislate or regulate against stupidity. The kid with the communist thing, stupid people will be, do stupid things. But I still think that the academies put out uh, a really good quality product of young man and woman who are gonna be our future leaders and officers. Because they wouldn't be there if they weren't dedicated to do that. You got a second part of your question about the. the well, uh, no, uh, the, it was that you answered the question. It was just what is going on when when a cadet like that with those kind of beliefs even makes it to the fourth year, much less graduates. Well, <clears throat> it depend. You know, who knows who knew, and how long. I I, I mean, I saw the article, but I haven't read the investigation. Um, cadets do stupid things. I know, I was one. I did a couple. You know? I heard more than a few, General. <laughs> you know, I was accused of rappelling out of my fourth floor window so I could get out of the barracks at night. You know? Which was totally untrue. <coughs> I didn't have to rappel out the window. I just walked out the gate, you know. <laughs> but I let that story stand because it was a great story. <laughs> yes, sir. I have a little bit different topic. Um, well, I, I noticed that he's, you, got, he's got the microphone. So. Oh, okay. Sorry, sir. General, as a former PFC, I'm humbled, to, and I feel inadequate asking you a question, but uh, I will anyway. Uh, I have a grandson who served in Afghanistan and had three vehicles shot out from underneath him. Upon coming home, he complained that the rules of engagement in the Middle East favor the enemy and put our troops in jeopardy. 
Could you please comment on that? Yes. The only good rules of engagement are written by lawyers that have already been shot at least once. <laughs> Every war we've had where we had rules of engagement, it's always been no one's liked them that's been on the ground. Uh, and everyone has complained that they favored the enemy. Same problem we had in Vietnam. You know, uh, you know it, it, it's, it's hard to deal with with fighting in a, in a built up area full of civilians. And who do you shoot, who do you don't shoot? Minimize collateral damage. Uh, I mean, you can't win the hearts and minds of the people while you're shooting their kids on the street by saying, hey, I'm sorry, you know, kid was in the wrong place at the wrong time. Uh, rules of engagement are very difficult. Um, and I, I don't have a solution for it, except get a lawyer that's been shot. Yes, General, I, uh, I was reading that you were at one time in your career a special agent um, in California uh, on the sexual predator apprehension team at, yeah. at one point. And my question is, um, what do you think about the pedophilia that's been, you know, recently, it's been going on for many years, but it's been recently um, brought to all, all of our attentions um, in the Hollywood, in Hollywood, and in our government, um, including you know the Sacramento um, government. Um, you know, the, anyways, you, you know what the, the pedophilia that's been going on. Well, pedophilia has been going on since time began. I mean, do we know? Do we know that there are more pedophiles today than there were yesterday? I mean, that's a question that we're more aware of that. I mean, all, I mean, there's always been Uncle Joe that you didn't leave the kids with. You know, there was always a strange person in the family. Nobody talked about it like we talk about it today. So is there more or less? No, we're just more aware of it than we have been in the past. Hi, um, I just wanted to ask your opinion on uh, uh, what's been going on in the military with transgender and uh, homosexuality. And you said it was an experiment, it always has been, but I'm just curious where, you, where your opinion is today on that, those issues. My opinion is that Congress passed the rules to uh, change the law to put them in, so we'll put them in and serve with them. I'm, I'm sworn to defend the Constitution, so that's my opinion. I have one quick question. I always heard it was 72 Virginians. <laughs> Could that be a possibility? That's a different, that's a different joke. <laughs> and you got it over there. Yes, General Hayes. I appreciate your service, and I read your biography. It's very impressive. Uh, I work for the United States Postal Service, and I was in the Air Force. I'm a veteran. Uh, you mentioned the thing about the letter throwing, so I do, I do that. <laughs> but uh, my question is kind of three part. I want to know a little bit more about your opinion of North Korea the situation and our situation with Iran. And the last question is um, is about uh, Senator McCain. Uh, how true is it that I've heard that he's never attended any of the uh, POW reunions, if you know that, and also, is it true that they call him Crash McCain? I've heard that from a good source. I, I don't know if they call him Crash McCain, and I don't know his personal schedule on whether he goes to any of the POW reunions or not. Um, you know, a lot of guys don't go to reunions, uh, but they just don't want to deal with it. And I think he's a very honorable man. That's my personal opinion. Um, as far as North Korea goes, uh, 
I mean, our our biggest, our best choice in in dealing with North Korea is through the Chinese, for them to for them to deal with them and sort it out. And Iran is a whole nother story, which I'm really not qualified to speak on. General, first of all, thank you for your service. Uh, in regard to a little current events, the the current uh, Bergdahl situation and Benghazi, uh, do you sleep better at night knowing that General Mattis is in charge of our military? And on the General Mattis, do you think we would have gotten the same results with those two cases? Well, first off, since I served with General Mattis in 1980, and we were captains together, and I went on liberty with General Mattis, I don't sleep well at night knowing he's in charge. <laughs> Uh, he wouldn't sleep well at night if he knew I was in charge either. <laughs> um, but yes, I think I, I, I'm very happy that he got the job. Let's put it that way. That's okay, keep him running back and forth. He needs the exercise. Uh, General, how do we fight a war that's not on the ground? A war that will attack our electromagnetic field? How do we fight a war that attacks our electromagnetic field? Yeah, that's not on the ground. I, I don't know. I'm not qualified in electromagnetic fields. I'm sorry. I'm a I'm a guy I'm a guy on the ground. And and as one of my bosses who was a tanker said, you know, I like to kill him a long way away. Jack likes to kill him up close and personal. So. All right. Thank you, General. Hey. I should have said this in the in the beginning, but that that was to honor Captain Michael Pagaling, U.S. Marine Corps, Captain Marshall Pagaling, U.S. Marine Corps, and Sergeant Caleb Newlin, United States Air Force. This is the, this is the man who has everything and who's done everything, but he does not have a dot in the wool. My favorite New Orleans tie. <laughs> Oh wow! <laughs> and uh, uh, coins are a big thing in the in the United States military. This is a Marine Corps coin, and he doesn't have one like this either. I can you rest assured. He may show it to you. He may not. Thank you, sir. You're welcome.